a few more people just joining us. Thank you very much for that, Julia. Um, welcome to the session, everybody, the SLA Europe CLSIG and Bile Careers Evening. My name is Sylvia Oakley. Uh, I'm representing SLA Europe, and I have Julia um, Bojo, who's also from SLA Europe, with me this evening. We've just popped up the agenda to give you an idea of the rundown. Um, Julia will be speaking first. Um, then we've got Vinny um, from Chatham House and Simon Burton and Tim Palmer, both from CBR Resourcing. And then we have a 10 minute break um, and then we follow up with um, Seema Rampasad um, from the British Library. Then we give you half an hour for questions. And then finally, we do a virtual tour of the British Library courtesy of Seema. So um, we've already invited you to use the chat, so do use it as well to put in any comments and react to people's comments and questions as well. Um, everybody who is attending um, will be muted and the cameras are off and we'll be recording um, the webinar and that'll be shared with you through the YouTube channel um, for SLA Europe. All the slides will be sent out to attendees too. And we're looking, especially tonight, um, for somebody who's willing to do a write-up, um, to, to do something um, that would reflect on what they've thought of the session uh, this evening. And we'll turn that into a blog post or an article. So if you're willing to do that, um, we'll credit you with your name and any other details that you'd like to add. Um, writing up um, an event like this is really good if you're doing um, CPD or doing reflection, if you're um, in the process of um, chartering or working towards another one of the sort of, um, qualifications. So if you'd like to volunteer for that, um, do let us know in the chat, that'd be great. So just to kick start, um, what I thought would be nice would be to get an idea of where you're coming from. Um, so to the next slide, um, where we'll see everybody's responses um, coming in. So you can see that um, the polls just really gauge in where you are in your career. You might be at the moment studying um, towards an information qualification, or you might be a graduate trainee, or you might be on your first post or mid-career. You might be thinking, well, actually, I might want to change the sector I'm working in, but I don't know how to do it. Or you might be thinking to yourself, well, actually, I'm not an information professional at the moment. I'm doing a totally different um, role, and I'm thinking about moving into that area. So let's just see what kind of answers are popping up. And oh, that's absolutely great. So the biggest response we seem to be getting at the moment is 24% for mid-career people. Um, and then we've got a oh, little jump there. That's now gone up to 22 for starting my information career. So that's 22 mid-career, 22 starting my information career. And then we've got a similar amount, 17% on wanting to change the information sector and studying to become an info information professional. And now that's just sunk, hasn't it? Um, so... So the top runner is starting my information career, 24%. And then we've got the studying to become an information professional and mid-career, both on the 19%. And then joint 14%, we've got one in the change information sector and changing career. And then we've got 10% who are actually working as graduate trainees at the moment. Absolutely fascinating. And I hope this will give all our speakers a good idea of where you're all coming from. So thanks very much for participating in the poll. So we've got our first speaker up next, which is um, Julia Bourdieu, who's currently Information Officer at Kingsley Napoli. Over to you, Julia. Fab. So um, welcome, everyone, um, to our careers evening. Um, as Hilary said, I'm going to be um, SLA Europe president next year. So if you've got any questions, whether it's um, to do with my role um, as an information officer or um, if you just want to learn more about SLA Europe, um, feel free to kind of ask me any questions tonight or offline through email if that's, um, that's easier for you. So I want to start off um, with sort of a bit of background about me. So um, I'm of mixed race ethnicity. Um, I primarily grew up in, in North London, which is sort of a working class 
um, neighbourhood and um, for my parents, you know, who didn't go to sort of college and uni, um, you know, the kind of premise was to do well academically, you'd be able to go to uni, get a good job um, and the rest of it. But, you know, I wasn't really thinking about my career and what I wanted to do. I definitely didn't want to do uh, the jobs my parents were doing. Um, and I sort of fell into uh, two volunteer roles uh, before university. Um, the first was um, as a summer reading challenge ambassador at my local library. Um, and this was because I wanted to do something in my local community. Um, I wanted to um, encourage reading um, for, in primary school students as well. So, and it was just sort of a really great way, um, A, to get out of the house, but B, just to sort of connect um, and kind of get some job experience. Um, so it was sort of helping um, literacy rates, um, primarily because, you know, a lot of kind of cuts to public funding, um, kind of limited um, opportunities for young people. So it was sort of celebrating that, but um, it was sort of my first real insight um, into public libraries. Um, and then my second sort of role fell in towards um, when I was studying for my A-levels. So I was um, studying history, government politics and English. Um, and as part of my history trip um, to the Wiener Holocaust Library, um, at the end of the tour, they said, we're looking for volunteers. Um, and this was sort of around the time um, that the library had moved to their new premises in Russell Square. So it was sort of part helping um, the library uh, market themselves, um, but also, you know, kind of bring back um, everyone to, to the new location, either for events, uh, book signings, or again, use their, um, their library, which is the picture here on the slides, uh, for research. So a lot of it is um, helping families trace uh, family members they've lost in the Holocaust or kind of um, genealogical research, um, again, for PhD, um, for kind of any academic publications as well. So that was um, primarily kind of a historical library. It was great fun, um, especially going on the on the guided tour and showing everyone um, the kind of retrofitted archive, which was actually in the in the wine cellar. You, know, you can imagine um, with sort of temperature control, humidity control, uh, making sure that anything in their archive was was well preserved for that for that research. Um, university then came along. Um, I was fortunate enough to join the Sutton Trust uh, summer school program, which was sort of a week long. Um, taste a course at Cambridge University. Um, I picked history, um, then realising I didn't actually like to do a history undergraduate degree. Um, so I ended up picking English at Queen Mary and that was sort of um, really fun um, at the time thinking um, I would go into a career either in the civil service or in publishing. I definitely wasn't thinking um, about libraries or the information management or anything to do with um, that sort of world. But um, I fell into it and I think a lot of the stories um, I've heard and I'm, I'm going to say um, were accidental so um, that was another way that I got into working with um, SLA Europe so I went to um, SLA Europe's first ever conference which was held in Cambridge back in 2019 um, and Seema Rampasad who you'll hear from later this evening actually said to me hey we're actually looking for uh, people to work on the Digicoms committee and that was to help with social social media and kind of um, the website which was was built on WordPress um, and she had seen my stuff through kind of Twitter and LinkedIn she said hey you'd be great for the committee so uh, that's how I got roped in I, I might happen to some of you but um, we are always looking for, for more volunteers um, and as I said I will be president-elect next year so if you do want to learn more about how you can volunteer with us um, yeah feel free to, to reach out. So my career to date, um, so I left university uh, with my English degree, um, and I think it's that panic after graduation um, where I got to find a job. Um, so as I, you know, started plugging away, um, you know, building my LinkedIn profile, um, uploading my CV to kind of the various job hunting websites, um, I came across um, a job advert for an information assistant role um, at an international law firm and I thought hey um, you know I'd been building my CV around my research skills that I'd built um, during my undergraduate degree and I thought this would be sort of a good um, a sort of a good role to get started um, and actually kind of you know post-graduation um, start getting some experience on my CV and kind of building towards that. Um, I actually didn't think too much about law firms um, mostly because 
you know, having the history and uh, government politics background, I thought that could help me, but I didn't have any kind of um, legal research training or anything of the sort. So when I did join, um, it was on a 12 month contract um, and it was a team of eight. So um, I was told, you know, six months training me and then six months I'd be training the next uh, information assistant and kind of being at that international law firm. Um, it was sort of a great mix between um, learning on the role, but also kind of sharing my knowledge as well um, and actually kind of delivering that um, information service to the lawyers, especially when you're working uh, both in the UK and kind of coordinating with people in other jurisdictions. Um, and it is a fast paced environment. So that wasn't something I was expecting, um, but, you know, you do get used to it. And I sort of had to kind of admit to myself um, that I actually did kind of thrive in that environment as well. So um, I took that all in mind. And for my next role, I did want something slightly bit more um, kind of less less junior to what I was been doing before. So my second role was as a knowledge analyst um, at a UK law firm. So it was primarily based in the UK and I was in a team of two. So it was just myself um, and my manager. And I really kind of felt the difference coming, having come from a big team of eight now to a team of two. Um, it was slightly different because I had more freedom in actually um, kind of tailoring our services um, and kind of taking the lead on um, research and inquiries, but I did have a lot of support from my manager, again, who said, you know, if you do want to go out there um, and network, and especially with professional associations like SLA Europe, like BILE, um, within kind of the law firm context, um, I was free to do that. So that was always, you know, a bit of encouragement, a bit of support there. Um, being in this role was actually my first experience of a law firm merger, and I think from what's uh, in the legal press and kind of in the press generally, it's always... Um, kind of hush hush discussions that happen but for what this actually means for the library team is actually um getting the collection uh, to actually matter in a way that you know things have to be thrown out because they're too old um you know i've had experiences of throwing books into the skip um or recycling them um but for this role it actually meant um traveling to different offices in the uk so again um not being London centric and actually traveling to kind of meet different lawyers, kind of expanding that relationship as well. So, um, you know, kind of both marketing, but also um, actually just sort of getting on with the day job as well to kind of promote the team. Um, during the pandemic, I decided I wanted to kind of pick up um, some new skills, um, primarily with um, web design or digital kind of marketing design and coding. Um, and that sort of fell into kind of what I was doing with SLA Europe, kind of revamping the website. Um, but I was also wanted to kind of uh, give back because I could see a lot of charities were struggling um, with their kind of external website. So that was sort of a way in for me, again, to kind of put these new skills um, to the test. Um, after that, which, you know, I'm in my current role now. Um, again, it's a UK law firm, but I'm an information officer. So this is sort of the next, um, I'd say the next level um, you know, going from an information assistant to a knowledge analyst, now information officer. Um, and in this role, I'm primarily um, kind of the lead for current awareness. So um, it's a team of four. Um, I'm the, kind of the junior member within this team, but I'm leading on the current awareness. Um, and that sort of alerts and things, uh, you know, either it's on legislation, on clients, um, any kind of developments in the law to the lawyers. And it's kind of kind of a real mix um, of kind of that and uh, and that legal research. Um, I've put future roles on this slide because I really don't know um, what the, my next role will be, but um, it would definitely kind of have a feature of either knowledge management or legal tech. Um, and with the discussion that's happening now in terms of AI, um, I think that will kind of definitely, definitely be a factor. So, um, I do want to give her sort of an overview of what happens in a law firm, because I think what we see um, kind of as a law library in terms of um, as different from kind of academic libraries um, is slightly different. Um, so it is mainly um, legal research and inquiries. These do come from the lawyers um, 
and we kind of work in tandem with um, our business development team and our marketing team as well. Um, but kind of, you know, the bread and butter is, is legal research and inquiries. Um, with some roles, there is obviously, um, you know, kind of training on using the legal research databases. So as long as you've got um, strong research skills, whether it's from your undergraduate degree like me or from one of um, previous roles elsewhere in kind of different field or different sector, um, that, will, that will kind of benefit you in that way. Um, law firms also have kind of a strong management of collections. So this is kind of a widespread across books, um, ebooks, you know, journals that we have, um, you know, whether it's legal publications, um, financial publications, anything um, that the lawyers would be interested. In. And that also ties in with kind of the various practice areas that we have as well. Um, and again, if you are in a law firm which has multiple offices, that's another consideration, um, especially post pandemic when um, kind of physical space is actually being reduced. Um, how do you make uh, books more accessible? And the answer usually is um, ebooks. So um, current awareness is another kind of aspect. Um, again, this is supporting um, what the lawyers would be interested in, in terms of what competitors might be doing, um, anything to do with kind of market intelligence, what the trends are, um, either if, you know, within the UK, if it's in the kind of jurisdictions, if any changes in the law that might be of interest as well. Um, knowledge management is kind of a key area um, as well. So um, with law firms and kind of sizing as well, um, you do want to make sure that there's a strong um, kind of know-how policy as well and that, that you know knowledge is actually being shared across the firm um, and that's where sort of uh, a legal and information professional team kind of steps into that as well. Training is another aspect so you've got to kind of be um, the face of the team especially when it's um, supporting the future lawyers because they will start out as trainees. Um, at my firm we kind of have um, an intake every September kind of a new new set of trainees who come in and then that's kind of steadily increased um, kind of as years gone by so usually it would start about for six uh, but now it's come up to kind of 10 12 um, trainees a year and so I'm kind of supporting them so we do a run through of kind of how to use the um, legal databases but again we have to kind of strengthen those skills that they've come from whether it's um, just finishing their degree or you know starting an apprenticeship or if they're still studying how do we um, keep supporting them through our training sessions um, you're also kind of involved in a lot of projects with our support teams um, whether it's kind of software um, with IT kind of new uh, kind of policies or processes that we've got to run through uh, whether it's with marketing, uh, especially if it's kind of a new team that's joining the firm, how do we get those um, to kind of be successful both internally and externally? Um, we're also kind of guardians, I should say, um, in terms of kind of the firm's history and um, through kind of the archive collection. Um, and this is also kind of in addition to what we maintain as archives in terms of legal texts that we keep uh, for the lawyers and for their work. So again, it's kind of the firm's history, any kind of milestones we want to, to celebrate because that's again, um, kind of sharing that internally and also celebrating as well. Um, professional development, this is something I've had um, quite successfully in previous roles, but supporting that. So um, again, making use of um, professional associations like BIO, like SILIP, like SLA Europe to kind of see again what's happening with other law firms, just talking to um, other law librarians, but again how we could also benefit um, as a team with um, whether it's tech or, or processes that we can implement. So um, I just want to run through kind of similarities and differences. So with law firms, um, kind of the ratio to the information team and lawyers is often smaller um, in UK law firms compared to uh, US or kind of other bigger international law firms where there's probably a bigger team um, and these kind of spread across jurisdictions or kind of main offices um, within those countries that 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 law firm has a presence in. Um, the location again most law firms are London centric but we are kind of seeing kind of growth in other UK cities um, and from personal experience as well there's a lot more opportunities for making um, or even for asking for the role to be hybrid or even fully remote as well. Um, a big discussion at the moment is kind of users versus stakeholders so we've got as an information team we've usually got um, different relationships um, across the firm um, especially when we're trying to a, sort out the budget for kind of any new purchases that we're trying to, to make, but also how we're responding. So whether it's um, metrics that we're kind of um, creating within the team, 
um, that we need to kind of report to, whether it's our efficiency that we need to report back on, uh, the level of inquiries, um, how we even kind of support new pitches within, within marketing. It's all kind of adding to this kind of very fast paced environment. Um, and hopefully that, that doesn't put you off, but it does mean um, there's a lot of different needs that need to be responded to um, across the firm as well. Um, you do need to put yourself out there in terms of kind of collaborating internally with other teams, um, kind of various areas of business that I've put there. It can be from anything. So um, kind of in a, as a difference to kind of academic uh, law libraries uh, where you would have um, kind of two or three members who would look after cataloging or kind of other similar processes. Um, this is sort of either shared within the team, whereas or you could have like a, a senior or a junior um, someone who takes the lead on something and then there's a junior as, as a backup there as well. Um, I've put budgets there as well. These are kind of often mapped to uh, the different practice areas. Um, and I've put there negotiation, um, negotiation skills are essential because you will be talking to um, various suppliers or vendors um, kind of often, you know, looking for that deal, especially when you've got um, users within the firm kind of add up to... Um, a big bill at the end of the year but making sure um you know you do get whatever um databases or journal subscriptions whatever it could be um kind of you know settle for for a price point there as well um offices as well so you know we are seeing less uh, physical space um my firm have recently moved uh to a new office building we were previously um where she kind of split between two two buildings and now we are um kind of a new custom an eco-friendly um, office space near Moorgate. Um, but we are kind of seeing less physical space, um, especially we're sending a lot more um, things to archive and kind of offsite storage. Um, current affairs, I think this is probably um, a similarity, but there, yeah, has to be an interest um, with what's going on uh, in parliament, in politics, within the law, um, in business as well, because um, anything can affect, um, you know, the lawyer's work, especially if it's something happening um, in another, country or jurisdiction which might have an impact um, on how it's seen here in the UK um, and as I said before um, tech AI and large language models um, there's a lot of things that are happening um, to kind of again improve those efficiency processes um, but again with communication and knowledge management um, we're sort of seeing more ways to kind of support um, internal communication and that's either through um, intranets, um, if you're kind of helping build build those, whether it's with coding skills or with, with content management as well. Um, I kind of want to round off uh, my presentation with kind of a few tips and advice that, um, that worked for me that I would hopefully uh, work with anyone on this um, call tonight. But leverage social media is one that um, I want to kind of put out there because Twitter and LinkedIn can be really useful if, um, you know, prior to an interview or prior to um, a job application, if they just Google you, they want to see um, what you're all about. So if you can leverage, uh, you know, those two platforms to work with you, especially with LinkedIn, um, I found it really helpful that if you want to um, post something or reshare something uh, prior to a job interview, it can just really help uh, boost your profile. Um, or you can create an About Me page, um, and that's simply a one-page website which has kind of all your information, um, just to kind of highlight highlight yourself if you want to avoid um, social media. Um, pick and mix the associations you join. So um, Biol is, um, you know, specifically for law librarians, but, you know, with organisations like um, CELEP or SLA Europe, you get a wider spread um, and you get to speak to many different librarians and information professionals working in different sectors as well and, you know, who have come from um, different countries. So you get to learn a lot more and you get to help build your own network. So those connections are really important if you want to, um, you know, learn about a job or role that you're applying for or you want to see what's sort of out there or again you just want to learn um what their day-to-day -day life is so um you know definitely go out there and build those connections and definitely use them um to your advantage as well um job hunting can be tricky um and i would definitely recommend building that support network around yourself 
um, I was quite fortunate that my um, university has sort of a graduate centre where you could go in and speak to advisors. Um, but if you don't have that, definitely build contacts um, around yourself, whether it's family members or friends. Um, if you want to have someone look over your CV or if you want to kind of run through a practice interview, um, make sure you have people there um, that can help you as well. If you are trying um, to apply to any law firms or kind of any academic law libraries, um, there is free material online published by the law schools, um, the Inns of Court and Baal as well, um, who run kind of a yearly, yearly course, but there is material online. If you just want to have a look um, and practice yourself, build your knowledge, um, you know, pretend you're a lawyer for the day and have a go because um, that would only help you um, in interviews um, and kind of any job applications if you're trying to understand um, what the job description um, entails that way. Um, interview advice. Um, this is the first one is one that that was said to me um, from an old manager, but um, make it flow. So I should said um, interviews should be a conversation, not an interrogation. So it shouldn't be stop start. It shouldn't be one sided. Um, it should be kind of a natural conversation between you and your your interviewers. Um, and if you're like me and you tend to rattle through through your answers, um, take your time. Um, they probably know you are nervous. Um, whether you're through your application or you know through your body language and your presence in the interview but yeah take your time um to answer and if you need to kind of breathe or take a sip of water do that just to make sure uh, you can calm those nerves uh second bit of advice is research 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 so before heading through an interview make sure you've looked through the job description um do look up your your interviewers on linkedin um you know you can google them as well um, if they're in kind of any legal press or if they've ever kind of presented at one of the association's conferences or at an event, it all helps you kind of building a picture of what your interview is like. And hopefully it makes it a bit less, less daunting when you sort of step into the room. Um, stress and anxiety. I've put a lovely picture of um, I can't remember her actress name, it's completely gone out of my head, but from Ted Lasso, she has that scene where she kind of builds herself up um, prior to kind of an interview or, you know, speaking um, or presenting. Um, but yeah, take some time if you need to, before you go into it, take some time to yourself uh, if you need to think through a question. And if you've got any kind of accommodations, um, please do ask because we try and kind of make uh, the interview process as smooth as possible for you. Um, my last kind of top tip um, is kind of keeping a custom service folder um, and this is something I picked up from a, from a colleague who suggested it but keep any bits of positive feedback any thank yous um, you know you saved my life um, or this was very last minute thank you for putting this so quickly any bits of feedback um, you've received keep it in a nice folder for you to, to look through um, especially when things are a bit stressed or you know things haven't gone wrong just to to keep that momentum going um, but also keep in the folder any kind of difficult situations where you've kind of really worked um, kind of the extra extra mile to pull something through because they're always good examples um, in an interview to use um, and I've also put your mistakes um, because you can always talk them through in an interview um, especially how you learned from them or what you could do differently as well and I think interviewers always like to see that as well. Um, and I'll just end my presentation there. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you do want to connect with me, um, please do. Or if you've got any questions, um, please do go ahead as well. Um, I've put links um, to my slides to kind of um, the other associations I mentioned um, and kind of the other groups I'm part of. So if you do want to, to learn more, please, please do go ahead um, and share and connect. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Julia. That was great. Um, now it's time to pass over to um, Binny Brinnell, who's the Digital Services Librarian at Chatham House. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hopefully everybody can see my slides. So um, my name is Binny Brinnell. My pronouns are they, them, and I am the Digital Resources Librarian at Chatham House. And Chatham House is a Policy Institute in International Affairs that's based in London. So thank you so much for inviting me here today. And I'm going to be talking about my background and my career and how I ended up in a special library like Chatham House. Um, some of the things I'll say are going to be quite similar to Julia. So I I'll try to um, be brief in some of the things I'm gonna say. But 
about my background, um, I've worked in libraries since 1996, so about 27 years now. It's gone by really fast. Um, I've worked in different kinds of libraries, public libraries, academic libraries, and now a special library. I am from the Wirral uh, near Liverpool in Merseyside, and it's where I now live again. After many years away, I've recently moved back here. So now I'm working remotely as my job is based in London. Um, outside of my day job, I am active in various ways with SILIP. Uh, I'm a SILIP trustee, and I am also on the committee for the SILIP LGBTQ plus network. And I'm also very active in my trade union prospect, um, both in my work and with the union itself. So about my background and my career journey, um, my undergraduate degree, I did that at Hull University and it's in Scandinavian studies. So um, similar to Julia, I had no idea that I wanted to work in libraries. I had no idea what I wanted to do at all when I went to university. I just knew that I, I wanted to learn Swedish and I wanted to read about Vikings. So I did Scandinavian studies. Um, I've always been a library user since I was a kid. Um, I love my local public library and I used to have weekly visits there and so on. So I've always loved libraries, but I didn't know that I wanted to work in them until in my final year of my undergraduate degree, I went to the careers department at the university. I did a careers test and it gave me a list of possible professions that I could be interested in and libraries was on that list. So I did some research about it. I read all about what it meant to work in a library and I decided that this was definitely the job for me but because I had done my degree in Scandinavian studies I'd already decided that after I graduated I was going to move to Sweden so I um, actually uh, did my postgraduate studies in library and information science at a Swedish university so I moved to Sweden in 1995 and um, after a few months there I got my first job in a library. Um, I was a library assistant in a public library in Lund, and Lund is a university town in the south of Sweden. Um, it was a, a, a large and busy public library system that I was working in. Um, you might know that uh, public libraries in Sweden tend to be well funded and very well used, so I worked mostly in the central library. Um, I worked at the issues desk, I was in the circulation team, I sometimes did shifts in the music library, so I did lots of different things and I got a really good grounding in what makes a library work. And during my first year there, I realized that I definitely wanted to continue working in libraries. The um, university in Lund, Lund University, um, they recently started doing uh, postgraduate degrees in library and information science. So I applied for that course and got in. So um, that's two years full time. And they don't require any experience of libraries, but I found that my experience working as an assistant was really, really useful during the course. And um, while I was doing my postgraduate studies, I continued to work part time in the public library, but also at a university library in the nearby city of Malmo. And actually, my very first professional position as a librarian was at Malmo University. And when I started there, I was very much a generalist. I had lots of shifts at the information desk. I did teaching, interlibrary loans, I did serials, I did circulation. I also did a lot of cataloging and I had extra training for that. Um, and I enjoyed all of those tasks. But uh, after I'd been there for a year or so, um, a position became available in the systems team at the university library. And having worked with the library management system quite a lot, doing cataloging and interlibrary loans and so on, I knew that I was interested in this. So I got that uh, position and my responsibilities there as a systems librarian was looking after the library management system and um, the discovery system and any other systems that we had. And that involves um, support for colleagues, uh, training, error reporting, upgrades and adding new functionality, updating search interfaces, all those kind of things. I was also involved in procurement of new systems with my team. Um, I also looked after the library's English web pages because uh, everyone in Sweden speaks really good English, but I am a native speaker of English. So I was interested with doing all of our, well, pretty much everything that we ever did in English with my job. Um, I also had shifts at the information desk here, which not all systems librarians do, but I find it really important. It's really useful for me to actually meet our users and see how they are interacting with our systems and see what's working and what isn't. 
And it is why I wanted to work in libraries so that I could um, work with people. So um, the information desk was really important for me. Um, and I also did some teaching as well. But then um, after about 12 years at Malmö University, and during that time, Malmö University had grown a lot. It was founded in 1998. So it was very new when I started working there. And we moved to from a small room to a bigger building and then to a very large purpose-built main library. So I saw a lot of changes during that time. But after 12 years, I decided I was ready for something else. And I'd also been in Sweden for about 16 years at that time. So I decided it was time to make a change. And I moved back to the UK, but I moved to London. So that was quite a culture shock after many years in Sweden. Um, and after a few months back in the UK, I got a job at another university library. And I worked for two years at London South Bank University, um, which is um, near Elephant Castle in London. It is in many ways similar to Malmö University, um, I'd say with the student demographics, the kind of university it is, the subjects they do, and the size as well. I'd say both of the libraries had about 50 staff and maybe we had about 25,000 students. It was quite similar. Um, and the job was very similar as well. I was a systems librarian again. We had the exact same library management system and discovery layer, but there were a lot of differences. Um, and I think the differences are between the way higher education is done in the UK compared to Sweden, but I've only worked in one university library in each country. So take, the, take it with a pinch of salt, what I'm gonna say. Um, I think in the UK, the library systems are more hierarchical. For example, I have had a grade at that university and um, there's no grades in Sweden. You just you just have a job um, um, routines are more strict. I found in the UK library and people are very much in their departments, whereas in Sweden it was more flexible. There was a very flat structure. We had a lot of cross departmental teams. Um, but that meant that some tasks fell by the wayside. And I'm not saying that one is better than the other because I enjoyed working in both kinds of libraries, but there are there are a few differences. Um, when I've been at uh, two years at um, London South Bank University, I got my job at Chatham House. So some of you may have heard of Chatham House. Um, it is also known as the Royal Institute of International Affairs. It was founded in 1920, so we recently had our centenary and it is located at Chatham House in St. James's Square. So it's it's known as Chatham House as well as the Institute of International Affairs because it is in Chatham House. Um, and the mission of Chatham House is to make the world a better place. Um, so that's done by analysing and promoting the understanding of international issues and current affairs. Um, so a lot of research is done, a lot of information is produced that can go out to policymakers, politicians, diplomats and so on, but also to the general public to help keep us more informed. Um, Chatham House is perhaps most famous for the rule. Um, and the first thing to say about the Chatham House rule is there is only one. And this is the Chatham House rule. So if you're in a meeting, it means that you can share the information that you hear in that meeting, but you can't reveal who said it. So it protects people in the meeting, it protects people who are speaking up. And in Chatham House's history, that means it's protected dissidents and um, opposition politicians and so on. People can be free to speak up without repercussions. Um, the rule can be used anywhere, not just, just at Chatham House, and it is used around the world um, for any kind of events where sensitive issues are being discussed. And it can help bring people together um, to generate ideas and to agree solutions to problems and to conflicts. Um, it's not used at Chatham House very much anymore. Most events these days are on the record, a few are off the record, but it's still a very useful rule. It has some implications for some of the archive material that we have um, and how who can access it and um, what we can say about it. But um, it's just something that we've always had. OK, and um, so that's about Chatham House. Now, the library itself is an integral part of the Institute. Um, so I've been there since 2014 now. Um, we are a small team, there's just three of us there, and um, we are very involved in the work of the Institute. As I said, a lot of research is produced and we support that. So we have books and journals and online resources and other kinds of materials. It's a relatively small but a very specialised collection um, covering international relations and related subjects. We also have um, all Chatham House publications from 1920 onwards. And that could be reports and briefing papers, um, increasingly in online format these days. And we also have a large archive, as I mentioned, which is 
a lot of material that's unique to Chatham House, and it really is the history of the Institute. Some sections of the archives have been digitized, but a lot hasn't, and we, are, um, we need funding for that kind of thing, but we'd very much like to digitize the rest of the archive for preservation and for access. Um, as I said, there's three of us in the team, but we're librarians, we're not archivists, so we are learning as we go, and we're being very, very careful with the materials. Um, and something else that we work with that I haven't done before is um, records management and knowledge management. Um, our library management system is Sutron and it is very flexible. It can be used for archives as well as for records and knowledge management. And um, for example, you can I can create any kinds of records and fields. We don't use Mark. It's very flexible in that way. And um, we can upload documents to it as well. So it works as a repository. Um, so I've been working with teams across the Institute to fulfill their information needs. So it's something I've, I've, these kind of areas of things I hadn't worked in before I started at Chatham House, but I'm learning a lot as I go. Um, Chatham House Library is, as a special library, it's quite different from places I've worked before in the larger public and academic libraries, um, but there's also a lot of similarities. So I said, there's three of us in the team, um, but and there's about 220 staff at the moment and we're all together at one site. So it's a lot smaller than other places I've worked before. Um, and things like knowledge and knowledge management and um, records management is new to me, as I said. Um, my role is broader. I'm, I am a systems librarian still, but my title is digital resources librarian. I look after journals, online resources, how to access them. I look after the library's web presence. I do teaching and all kinds of other tasks, any things that come along. Okay. Our users are also a bit different. Um, staff have high level needs for information and they usually want it right away. So we are getting hold of articles and things like that a lot. Um, we have a lot of members as well. It isn't just staff that use the library, but Chatham House members. There's about 6,000 of them. Not all of them use the library, but there's all different kinds of people who are members of Chatham House. So it could be people who just want to come and sit in the library and read a magazine, or it could be students or researchers or journalists who need to borrow books or do some research online. We have one-off researchers who want to consult the archives, for example. A lot of our members want to access online resources, but they're experience of that varies a lot. So I help them help them access our resources basically and help them search them. And I work to try and make the experience as seamless and intuitive as possible. Um, our collections are quite different. The, it's a very small and specialized collection and um, about 80% of our collection is kept off site. We don't have room for it in the library itself. The 20% that's in the building is the most recent materials that we have. Um, and we also have a bespoke classification system and bespoke subject headings because it's a very niche collection. If we use something like Dewey, um, probably most things will be on the same shelf. So that's not that useful for us. So there's a lot of upkeep with both of those systems. I mean, the kind of services we have, we have the usual services you'd find in a library, but our capacity can be limited because we are a small team doing a lot of things. So um, we don't do literature searches for researchers. Um, we do do training, but it's not regular. It's as needed. Um, we do interlibrary loan, but we don't advertise it widely to our members, for example. Um, and our budget is small, uh, proportionally small. So I know money is an issue everywhere, but um, I found that we can buy the books that we need, but we have to be very careful about the online resources and online journals that we um, subscribe to or purchase. If something isn't being used, we pretty much have to cancel it. Um, so we don't have as many resources as a university library might have, but they are more specialised. We have a very small collection of ebooks. Um, it's growing, but cost is a factor there as well. But working at Chatham House Library, it is incredibly interesting. Um, and I get a chance to go to events and to meet people and listen to people and do projects that I wouldn't have been able to do anywhere else. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about being a systems librarian, how to become a systems librarian. Um, and I think I, it's fair to say I am an accidental systems librarian. There's even a book called Accidental Systems Librarian because there's so many of us that fell into it in the way that I also fell into being a librarian. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a computer science or a programming background to be a systems librarian. It's definitely useful for some roles, but it's um, what's equally as important is your your skills and your knowledge um, and your aptitude and your enthusiasm. So there's a lot of learning on the job. Um, so if you are 
like excited by systems. If you have the right kind of brain, for example, if you really enjoy cataloging, you'll probably enjoy working with the system. Um, if you are very keen to learn about things, um, learning as you go and not afraid to try things out, then you might enjoy systems. And it's also an awful lot of working with others because you're very much supporting your colleagues. Um, there's lots of support, lots of training, lots of collaboration. Um, I really enjoy working as a systems librarian and I have learnt most of my skills on the job and sometimes I've done courses outside of work or sometimes during work um, but I also I join user groups, um, I go to uh, systems forums, I go to conferences when, when I can um, and I learn a lot that way as well. Um, and there is an awful lot of working with others and collaborating with other teams, especially at Chatham House. And about um, becoming a special librarian and working in special libraries, um, subject knowledge isn't always necessary to work in a special library. Um, I don't have a background in international relations. I don't think my degree in Scandinavian studies really counts, um, but I was recruited to Chatham House for my skills and my knowledge as a systems librarian, because that's what they needed at the time. Obviously, I've learned a lot working there, but it wasn't necessary for that role in particular. And I find that can be true for a lot of the support roles at the Institute. So it's more about your library knowledge and information skills. Um, and it's very likely to be small teams, which means your roles will be a lot broader. Um, if you are coming from a larger academic library, for example, you'll find that it, our libraries, special libraries can be very, very small. You might even be a solo librarian, which is something to consider. Um, and there can be a lot of collaboration with teams um, across the workplace. Um, you won't just be working with your library colleagues, you will be working with all kinds of different colleagues in different departments. Um, I found a lot, um, I, it's been really useful for me being involved in organisations and networks such as SLA Europe, um, also SILIP. Um, it's good to get involved in committees in both of those, for example. Um, there is a um, a networking organisation called uh, LILA, which is London Independent Libraries and Archives, um, and that is made up of people who work in various special libraries um, around London. It could be law libraries, it could be special libraries like um, Chatham House, um, but it could also be things like club libraries, where you just have a solo librarian looking after archives, artworks and a library all by themselves, and organisations like that are really, really useful so you don't feel as isolated as you might otherwise. Um, I don't have lots of tips for um, uh, jobs, job searching and interviews, and I know I'm running out of time as well, but I will say a site that I find incredibly useful and read all the time, even though I'm not currently job searching, is Ask a Manager. Um, if you've seen that blog, it has a lot about interviews and CVs and how to write a killer application, for example. So Ask a Manager is good for that. And if you're in a trade union, they may have uh, careers advice too. I know that my library definitely does. Okay, hey, so um, I'm going to wrap up now. So uh, just some contact information. Uh, Chathamhouse.org is how to find our website and you can find the libraries page on there as well. This is my work email. If anybody has any questions, um, you can just contact me later. I am also on Twitter for my sins, um, but I have uh, recently become more active on Mastodon and you can find me there. Okay, so that's uh, the end of mine. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for that, Billy. Yeah, it's very insightful. So um, we're running a bit behind schedule, but I thought it would be best to go on and get um, Simon and Tim to talk to us. Um, they're both from CB Resourcing, so you can see careers from another side, and then we'll have a break. So over to Tim and Simon. Thanks very much. Um, lots of really helpful advice in those presentations. I'll just start sharing our presentation. Excellent. So just very quick introduction to us. We're a recruitment agency focused on all things information. So for us, that means knowledge management, libraries, archives, records management, and all of the related um, areas. We work extensively in the legal sector, um, particularly in the UK, um, primarily because there's lots of large teams in that area. But we actually, so it's what you'll see us do a lot of, but um, we actually work in all kinds of sectors from oil and gas to, um, for instance, at the moment, we're working with the Church of England on a position. Um, so it's a very wide range of things that we do. Um, in terms of our backgrounds, um, we've, uh, we, we've, we've both been working in this area now for a number of years. Um, the business, we set it up in 2014. Um, and 
I'm currently a, a, a SILIP trustee, um, like, like Binny. Um, I was also heavily involved in SLA Europe in, in the past. I was SLA Europe president in 2019, uh, which was also a, a great experience. And I'll, I'll just let Tim introduce himself now. Um, and then he has a, a slide to go through. Brilliant, thanks Simon. Hi there, I'm Tim. Um, I have been working for CB Resourcing probably for, I think it must be seven years now. It's gone very, very quickly indeed. Um, thanks to working with some really great people, not just internally, but uh, also in the industry as well. Um, just a bit of background on me. Um, prior to working in libraries, I was involved in IT recruitment for probably 12 years. Um, but yeah, I do a lot of the work with um, our law firm customers, uh, so funding people who are information officers, researchers, uh, knowledge management, um, and uh, also taken up a position very recently uh, in Biol as well on their PR and uh, promotions committee as a student liaison officer. Um, I will kick things off uh, by talking about um, putting together an attractive CV. Uh, sadly, we only have a very short amount of time to cover this and it's something I could probably talk about for at least an hour uh, but I've got to try and condense this down into broadly seven and a half minutes before I hand over to Simon. Um, so I think first of all if you ask 50 people what constitutes a good CV chance I'll probably get 50 different answers but um, for me I think there's a few key points uh, that are the basis of a, a strong and attractive CV. Um, <clears throat> I think First and foremost, uh, the CV, it's your individual sales document. And the reality is um, that in a lot of application processes, particularly where there's a lot of competition from other applicants, if your CV doesn't stand out in the first five, 10 or 15 seconds to the reader, there's a very strong possibility that they might not get very far into that document before making their decision. Um, why do I say that? Um, it's very often the first person that reads your CV might not be an expert in libraries or information. Um, they might be someone who's perhaps a generalist recruiter or someone internally at perhaps a law firm or a university. And um, they might be looking at many, many jobs and um, looking at uh, yeah, lots and lots of applicants and sending those CVs on to those that, uh, that, that do know how. Um, just a good example of where that might be relevant is um, if you, for, or certainly for us, if you put an advert together and let's say it's on behalf of a law firm who are looking for a graduate to join their information team, you'll find that the uh, terms law firm and graduate attract an awful lot of people who um, aren't um, library specialists, but they do want to work in a law firm and they are a graduate probably of law and uh, it will attract dozens and dozens of applications from people who aren't suitable and ultimately someone has to sift through all of that. Um, that leads me on to the uh, next point, which is um, impact. Um, from my perspective and having done a, a look at it, probably I guess nearly a million CVs in my lifetime, um, I don't think it matters uh, how long your CV is, whether it's one page or 50 pages. Um, I think for me, the bit that really counts is the first two thirds of the first page, um, or essentially uh, part of the CV that you can see on a laptop or a PC screen um, when you open a Word document. Um, I say that because when you send your CV to a large or complex organization, the probability is that the first person that reads that will probably be a generalist internal recruiter. They'll be working on multiple different roles, probably not understand the nuances of our industry, let alone library or information work. Um, some of them will possibly even um, skip looking at CVs altogether and just get all the CVs and do a keyword search in their database. Um, so yeah, it's really, really important that it's got impact um, and brings me on to my next point, which is that it really should be, uh, make it relevant and keyword rich. Um, I use this as, as an example, um, really for, let's say someone who's um, studied a master's degree in um, library and information studies and they want to work in a law firm and they've applied to a job. Um, if their CV opens with something along the lines of that, uh, with a profile that says that they are 
ambitious, they're able to work in a team, um, they can also work alone, uh, they have a good sense of humour, um, and then ultimately they put their qualification at the very bottom of their CV, well, the person who's reading that in the first sort of five to ten seconds, they're thinking, where's the relevance? So it's really already fighting a, an uphill battle. Um, but if you open your CV, um, again, same position, and you open it with something along the lines of that you're a graduate with a master's degree in library and information science, you're seeking to pursue a career uh, in either knowledge management or information services function within a law firm, um, that you've got great customer facing skills, the ability to learn quickly, and you enjoy the challenge of research, well, you'll probably have the person's um, attention pretty quickly. Um, just how do you make it key, uh, well, keyword and key phrase rich? Um, I think really good advice is to start looking at the sorts of um, roles that you want to apply for and those sorts of job specs, familiarise yourself with the common terminology and phrases that are in those documents. Um, and yeah, I think if you can start um, applying those uh, into your CV, um, it's going to be extremely useful. And you can do that in all sorts of different places in your CV. So that could be in the profile section that you open with. With your education, you might include the modules uh, and also in your work history. Um, I say this to people who are at the beginning of their career, so perhaps not entirely relevant to everybody. Um, but um, if you've not got any experience working in a law firm, for example, or perhaps even a library, um, and your experience is perhaps entirely retail based, or you've perhaps just been working in a bar, um, you'll still be applying and using many of the competencies that uh, these firms require. Um, it's just that it's in a different setting and they use different terminology to describe the same tasks. Um, a few examples of this that I've got are uh, customer service, I guess you could describe that as a form of stakeholder management. Um, you might say that managing difficult or challenging customers is very much the same as managing challenging stakeholders. Um, if you're getting good feedback from your manager or from the customers that you're serving, well, in effect, you're adding value. Um, balancing, if you're a, again, if you're a student and you're sort of balancing the need to um, do your studies and uh, pay for your education uh, by working well you could describe that as managing some conflicting priorities um, and I often say to a lot of people that a dissertation is a, an absolutely marvelous example of a project because you'll have milestones you'll be undertaking research and you'll be working to deadlines so a lot of that uh, terminology is um, can apply that to a CV um, even if you don't have that commercial experience um, I say to people that I think a CV needs to be a business document. Um, there's a good chance that when you send your CV an application for a role, um, it's going to pass through quite a few systems um, and through the systems of several interested parties. So that could be through a job board. It then might come to a recruitment consultant. It then might go on from the recruitment consultant to a, an organisation. And they've all got different systems. And I can assure you that the more complex your CV is and the more boxes, graphics, pictures, uh, the higher the chances are of that document becoming corrupted somewhere along the line. And uh, I say that from experience because I've spent many an hour trying to repair a CV that's become somewhat corrupted in that process. Um, so my advice, um, Keep it very simple if you can, uh, stick to something like MS Word, um, and I say think very much sort of substance over style. Um, when I say business documents um, as well, my own sort of quirky test to see whether it looks like a, a strong, valid uh, business document is to print out a physical copy, put it on the desk, um, put it so I can just about not read the words that are on it, and does it sort of have the structure, format and flow of what I would consider a professional document? Um, so yeah, a bit of a bit of a quirky tip there and maybe not for everyone. Um, said it should be flawless in terms of spelling and grammar. Um, again, this comes back to a CV being your personal sales document. Um, rarely do you um, have a deadline in place uh, in terms of composing a CV. 
Um, so I really strongly recommend that after you've created a first draft of your CV, send it to your friends, send it to your family, uh, send it to your sort of trusted advisors, as it were. Um, and not only to get a second opinion, but uh, also to get them to check for grammar and spelling. Um, I know from personal experience, I tried to write a CV and uh, I thought it was absolutely perfect. And then the person who interviewed me pointed out that there were actually three errors on there, which uh, if I'd sent it to someone else, I probably would have spotted. Um, also, I would say if you've written in your CV, in your skills, for example, that you're extremely attentive to details, uh, particularly the minor ones, and that you're an excellent communicator, um, the person reading your CV will probably be checking for this and you also need to be able to back that up uh, in your CV. Um, just a final bit of advice that's not on the slides. Um, I say that probably each time you apply for a different job, you should probably put together a different CV. Um, you know, just tailor it really for those individual roles, pick out the phrases in the specs um, that are, are valid and, and where you can um, apply that to, to your CV. Um, I think I'll pass you over to Simon now, who will um, talk to you about some of the finer points of uh, what goes into a CV. Great, thank you, Tim. That's uh, that was really helpful. Um, some really good tips there. Ah, there we go. Um, good. So, just thinking about the the, the structure of a CV. Um, so um, and 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 this goes for for LinkedIn profiles and, and other social media as well. Um, particularly LinkedIn um, is something that employers very often use to 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 check you out, and and it's a really useful platform for you to check them out as well as as uh, one of the earlier speakers alluded to. Um, you know, it's really really helpful to see um, who you're meeting, what their sort of background was, how long they've been in a business. Um, but for you as well, I, I highly recommend if you're not on LinkedIn, check it out. It's not necessarily for everyone, um, but it is a great platform to to network and 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 stay up to date with what's going on in your industry. Um, so put together a profile. So um, you know, as Tim said, it's really important to use that as a platform to get someone's attention. Um, you know, try and stay away from the sort of generic stuff that. Um, you know, is, is, is very sort of uh, focused on um, what we would call self-assessment. Um, so, you know, I'm a really great, um, you know, team, team player. Um, try and give evidence of that. So, you know, I've, I've, I've built really good team, um, team working skills within my work at, you know, X company or, or, or a particular thing that you've been doing. Um, when it comes to education, um, you know, I think Tim touched on uh, several points on this, uh, which is really helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, draw on some of the content of those courses that you've, you've worked on that are relevant to the job that you're applying to. So if you've done particular modules that are relevant, um, list those, um, you know, all those achievements and any activities you've got up to around that whilst you're in your education um, you know, it's really, really helpful to include that in your CV um, and help it tell the story, particularly where it attaches to um, the theme of the job that you're applying to. Um, so, um, you know, that's that's really important. And as Tim was talking about, um, you know, it's really about showing your intent to work in the area that you're applying to. So, um, you know, as he said, you very often get lots and lots of people see the keywords in a job advert and apply. Um, and they might not actually be interested in, in working in this area, but they think, great, a law firm that's looking for a graduate and haven't necessarily read any further. And that's what an HR team are dealing with. So they, they, you, you really have to make it obvious that, um, you know, you're committed to and you're really interested in a career in this, this space. And even if you haven't got the education yet and you haven't done the course yet, you know, get it in your profile and make it really, really obvious that, that this is what you want to do and you're interested in it. Um, when it comes to work history, um, there's, you know, I, I think Tim hit on a few points that are really, really helpful. Um, we've actually done um, a couple of different research reports uh, with hiring managers in the sector. We did one with um, hiring managers within academia, and I think we had about 70 managers reply. And we did one with um, the legal sector with 
Um, it was a similar number. I think it was about 80 hiring managers across the UK. So a, quite a large sample actually on, on, on both counts. And it was really interesting when we looked at priorities for hiring, um, the number one thing that came back in both of those um, research reports was customer service orientation. And even if you don't have relevant um, work experience to working in the sector yet, um, you know, so important to get that um, other experience you might have that's relevant on there because it will be seen as valuable, particularly if you're presenting it in, in and articulating it in that in that way and talking about your customer service experience. So if you've worked in a hotel or you've worked in, you know, um, uh, a retail environment, um, or even if you've volunteered, you know, volunteer at a, at a local library, volunteer, at, you know, with charities or anything like that, you're dealing with, um, you know, lots of different sorts of people. Um, and, and, and that's incredibly valuable. Um, again, you know, this sector, we're so lucky with all of the networks and um, and professional bodies that we have, um, they are a really great platform for you to build your skills and experience. So, um, you know, most of them will have Digicom's co digital communications committees. Um, most of them will have, um, you know, committees for new professionals. Most of them will have um, PR and promotion committees. So um, there's lots and lots of opportunities um, to get involved in these things. And again, you know, that can really help um, add weight to your application. And I know from talking to hiring managers and just looking at the people that do really well in this sector, very often it's those people that get involved in some of the stuff that's going on around them and build their professional network. And, and, and um, you know, it's and it's a great place to a uh, great way to to make friends as well um, who, are, who are working in this space and and um, and, and relevant to um, what you're doing um, in terms of key skills. Um, I think you know it depends on the particular sorts of roles that you're looking for um but you know there are some um you know uh, emerging areas so for instance if you think about something like knowledge management um there are a number of technologies in there that are really helpful to know um so things like sharepoint etc um those sorts of collaboration tools um some people will be really interested in for instance going into research so um we always suggest to people if they're um, you know, new graduates go along to, you know, the British Library or go along to, um, you know, um, some of the um, webinars that some of the information providers do and just get familiar with some of the tools that are out there. Um, and you will find that other professionals in the industry are, are pretty kind in this sector. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really worth getting involved in some of the professional networks and asking people the sorts of things that you should be looking at to, to develop those skills. Um, while you're going through that kind of job searching and application process. Um, when it comes to um, interests and hobbies, um, again, I think, you know, steer away from the being being too generic, but, but um, you know, there's, uh, you, you'll always see thousands of CVs that, that talk about, you know, enjoy going to the cinema with friends or, um, you know, enjoy socialising. Um, I, I, I think, you know, try and get some things on there that, um, you know, um, you can talk passionately about, um, you know, and, and that may well be aligned to, you know, what you do in your working life. It very often is in this sector, um, but try and try and get some things on there that um, will help spark a conversation in an interview. Um, and just a, a, a final thought on CVs, um, and this goes for how you prepare for interviews as well really try and understand what their process is and how they're assessing you. Because if, for instance, it's a competency-based interview, um, or uh, then it's very likely they're scoring you based on um, evidence that you show in terms of examples of where you've shown those specific competencies that they're asking for and listed in their job spec. Um, so if you're going to an interview, um, it's really, really worth preparing your examples. Look at the competencies that are asking for and prepare examples that speak to the things they're asking for. And as Tim said, they don't need to, you know, not all of them need to necessarily be in the workplace if you're a graduate, um, but it's really, really useful to get that, um, you know, along with you, with your, with your preparation notes, um, you know, because if you get stuck, it's great to have those to refer to, um, but think about your CV in the same way. So, they're asking for specific experience. 
just think about how you articulate that in terms of examples, um, but also make sure that when you're um, applying to an organization, um, just think about the fact that, you know, as, as Tim said, you may have several different audiences there. So, um, you know, you may have an HR team that have to deal with lots of different areas of their business. So they might not know all the acronyms that are in our sector. They won't, you, you can't assume they have all the knowledge of um, exactly how we do things. Um, so just make sure that you're explaining it in a way where someone who isn't necessarily a specialist in this area can understand and, 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 and match it back to the job spec that they've put out there. And the best way to do that is to customize your CV and, and give those examples that directly relate in the type of language that they've used in the job spec. Um, good. So I, 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 I think <laughs> we've covered a lot in uh, 15 minutes. And as Tim said, we could, we could go on and on um about these these subjects um and we tend to um you know really enjoy these and and uh end up working with many of the the um many of the people that attend these over the years so uh if we can be um helpful to anyone we're always happy to take a look at people's cvs if you see jobs that we're posting we're always happy to have a conversation uh, i'll put our details in the chat um and we'll be very happy to hear from anyone if we can be useful thanks very much Thank you very much, Simon and Tim. You've given us some great ideas and insight into doing CVs and what to put into our applications as well. So next we have um, Seema Ramprasad um, from the Business and IP Centre at the British Library. Hello, everyone. I'm actually in the office. Um, I'm coming to you from the office today. Um, and I just wanted to clarify, I'm going to speak briefly about my career and then I'm going to do a quick whistle stop tour of the British Library. Is that right, Hilary? Yes, that's lovely. Thank you yeah. very much for that. So, hello, everyone. Um, I am actually uh, Seema from, I work at the British Library. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about um, uh, the, you know, my career um, as so far as getting into the British Library. And also I'm actually president of SLA Europe. Um, uh, sorry, past president of SLA Europe, but also president of SLA headquarters, uh, which is the global organization. So Julia, Hillary, and Simon are uh, all my colleagues, and we've done amazing things in the past. And um, it's definitely one of the things you'd want to do as a student to get involved. And um, I hope that we can convince you about how, how great it is to actually be part of um, a great network of people to support you with your career um, as you, as you um, progress through the years. I think I had a mashup of all the slides. So um, SLA um, means Special Libraries Association. I, I was um, listening to Binny's um, description of Chatham House. And, um, you know, it's great that to, there are certain libraries in the world that are specialized. We're not academic. We're not um, public public libraries like I work in the British Library. So there are specialisms in information, the information professions um, uh, as we know it. And um, SLA um, really captured that when they were formed 115 years ago, um, mainly in North America, but over the years they've expanded across the world. And it is um, a network of professionals who like to share, learn and network from each other. It's great for showcasing um, you know, expertise that you might have. Um, we have a we live in an interconnected world, a hyperlinked world. So we have communities in various regions as well as different subject areas. Um, and we try to encourage um, equitable access and collaborate across the world. And um, as a career librarian, SLA has been really be, been important to me. Um, one of my um, university friends actually worked with Binny, and um, we both did an undergraduate degree in um, information and, and, and library studies a long time ago when things were before the internet. But even in those early days, um, we were able to um, learn about managing information and information, um, online searching um, and various things that made sure that we had the foundations for the skills um, from not just a career that changed due to information technology and advice advancement, but actually revolutionized the way that we share knowledge and information um, in the 30 years that we've, we've been involved in the industry. So SLA has been really phenomenal in terms of um, my career development in the last um, 20 years. I worked at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, one of my first jobs um, um, 
uh, after graduating um, in the early 90s. And it had allowed me to take up roles and go to events and network and share um, social events with my SLA um, Europe uh, members here in, in London and in the Europe itself. Um, I couldn't afford or couldn't have the time to go to America to their conferences, but I would certainly read their articles, um, attend their professional development events that were mainly hosted in London. And over the years, I kept um, being pulled into various committees and various sort of roles within SLA Europe. Um, and I was able to um, gradually progress my career to SLA pre president. I didn't nominate myself at SLA president, but I'm quite passionate about voluntary um, work as well as keeping up on professional skills. And um, I was able to develop my career uh, with SLA. So these are some recent photos with SLA. Um, it's very much a, a global organization. It used to be very big. Uh, it used to have like 10,000 members um, up to about 10 years ago. But the the industry has changed a bit and people are getting some professional development events such as this one, which are freely available without paying a cost um, to attend. So we also have um, obviously dedicated members who, who really need to be SLA members and um, actively involved in their committees and their specialisms and for developing the career. But it has been great for me. The picture on the right hand top was our lead leadership symposium I went to in New Orleans, which sort of really helped me to learn sort of a, a lot of things about diversity and inclusion in terms of incorporating that in the profession, but also in my day job. Um, I went to Dublin and we, we have members Members there. I went to India this year where I was able to meet with um, IFLA President Barbara Bison is actually in the photo with me and our um, SLA Asia community. And I also went to the SLA conference and it's only my second conference with SLA because I couldn't afford to go. Um, I used to use my money to go on family holidays and not go to SLA. And sometimes it's hard when we're your work environment don't support you. But we have been great um, as SLA Europe to support new professionals to go to conference. We've had about 30 early career awards um, given to young professionals who went to SLA. Um, they're probably heading towards their 30s or 40s in terms of their career since graduating um, because the early careers no longer looks at it in terms of um, how soon after you're graduating, but we look after um, how long you've been in the profession. So they, they have been phenomenal in terms of giving people opportunity to go to America and network and, and, and open a whole network of people in the globe um, at conference. So the conference did happen this year. It happened the year before as well. We're not sure how big um, there's going to be one next year. It might be smaller and more intimate. It might be in a university in the US. But if you want to get involved, if you want to see those opportunities, if they come along, if you want um, you know, endorsement in terms of getting involved with us, we do encourage um, students and new professionals to get involved. We have 15% of our membership is actually students. I hosted a student event at the beginning of January, and there were 55 students who came on live. I think we also have recording. So it was also shared with um, university um, uh, in North America mainly um, to, to come along to SLA events and to become active members of SLA at a very early stage in your career. So obviously most of our members are full-time people working in jobs, very varied from NASA to, um, I know yesterday I hosted an event with SLA uh, Canada Parliament to uh, Asia, um, to the Philippines, uh, Europe, we're, we're actively involved. This is one of our e events. Um, so it's a great opportunity to start your career um, in a geographical region, but with our international remit. Obviously we have um, uh, collaborations with Bile and Silip here in London, but and we tend to focus uh, in mainly in the UK and we hope to expand more in Europe. Yesterday we had an SLA Europe meeting and we hope to target our, our near, nearer neighbours here in U, um, Europe, but 
generally um, SLA is mainly North America, then Canada, we're the third biggest, and then um, Asia is very, very active in geographical region. We have a great um, uh, specialism such as business and finance community um, with SLA. We do leadership and management at the conference in Detroit. Um, our specialisms in leadership and management development is really apparent. We had the Medical Libraries Association actually coming into our areas and attending our events because they don't tend to do leadership and management as good as SLA. So, um, you know, SLA still has a great specialism in all of some of these areas. They have pharma, health, technology community. They have military libraries community. Um, they look at knowledge management. They have a data community. Um, so lots of data centric jobs were, um, uh, were you know, job titles that people actually involved in um, SLA. And this is probably a growth area for us. And also at the SLA um, MLA conference in Detroit, there were lots of data focus events. So we do have lots of volunteers. So we encourage you to get involved at an early stage in your career, um, you know, do, do, do 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 um get in touch with Simon, um, Julia, uh, Hillary, and myself, and we can also um, see and meet you and show you around and give you any tips that you might need to build your career. Um, I just said in the chat that I quite like um, being on the cusp of um, technology. So uh, SLA was one of the first virtual associations to actually do online events. I've done hundreds of um, talks and events for SLA over the years, and um, it actually really does help you to think about us in a digital world. Things like such as uh, using virtual reality, um, fab labs, all of those sort of techie um, aspects of um, how the career is developing. It's really great um, experience that I've gotten over the years with SLA. We have a learning hub. All our events go into our learning hub. So we have content that stays on there for a while and you can have access to it. We are going through a strategic plan change. We have a new management company that's coming on board and we're proactively working to help people learn, connect and advance their careers. We leave, leverage the network of the of, of, um, SLA, which is very diverse and very broad. So some of the things we work on is like diversity. Um, you know, we keep it, you know, we keep it track of um, all of those underprivileged in society and invite them to come along to our events. We offer free places. Um, so it's a big part of what we do. We've been one of the forerunners of LBGT plus um, events, as well as um, policy stance. Um, I recently did some climate change um, events with our workplace preparedness committees. And we actually a quite low paid for student membership only um us dollars um 10 us dollars to be a member if you want to be a member and i think we're offering some bursaries today so do get involved there's multiple ways that we try to be inclusive and um we're actually going through a lot of change now um going into the new uh new financial year which is 1st of july with um some american management a company called ah which are helping us to target some of the, the gaps that we miss in on um in our strategy as well as in our membership and to regain some of the people that we lost in recent years because of COVID. So that's SLA. I am SLA president, which is a, a lifetime achievement for me. But I started um, obviously my life in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I grew up in a loving home. I went to a girls school. I actually came to study information and communication here, not intentionally. So I actually, uh, defaulted by become become becoming a librarian when I graduated and um I have always been involved in sort of community related stuff regarding um information so my first job as I said was PwC which was at the time using databases and CD-ROM but it was a global community and it really helped me to actually be able to withstand some of the things that I go through with SLA being a global organization um they they still do great things at uh, PwC. I then went on to to work at the Greater London Authority, which was um, you might know a city hall in London. Again, we had a holistic approach to information. We had a little bit like being like we had you know international aspects, but also political current awareness. We had a specialist collection. Um, we you know we used to write bulletins. We had urban data. It was really on the cusp of the digital revolution, and I was really involved as well using my information technology skills for the women's network. There have holding um, events that to bring staff together and to cover things that women um, need. I think that's now called the gender network um, support within the GLA, and I also use my skills. To host knowledge management events or digital media at the time. 
Um, I now work at the British Library, which I'll come on to as a, a quick tour, whistle tour of what we do. And it's a great place to work. I mainly work in business and we have a lot of um, projects that happen over the years. We we now have 22 business and IP centre uh, across England and, and Scotland. We had only two when I started 10 years ago. So there's been a lot of project work over the years. I've learned to give advice clinics for business, not something that I naturally did um, 10 years ago. And it for me, it really is a great place to work. Yes, I work in business, but the British Library, as you know, is great in terms of the cultural um, things that we have here. My first year at the British Library, we had the Mughal Empire um, exhibition, which in which which I didn't know about. So it really did help me when I went to my visit recently, 10 years later to India um, as SLA president. And um, I do belong to SLA. I don't think I'll ever stop being an SLA member. I'll be one of those retirees who remain an SLA member because it's been so great for my career in terms of volunteering experience and learning about technology, being on committees. Um, it, it, it really is a lifetime achievement for me to be their president. And I really am not going to give it up because it's been so great for my career. So do get involved with SLA. And I hope um, you can actually um, get in touch with me and see how you can take part and how you can, um, you know, get involved in our committees. And um, I hope that uh, you can one day be part of us and and actually um get you know uh how do you say um be fully involved and immerse on it now i only have about 10 minutes because i think we've overrun so i'm going to do a very quick tour of the british library for you um i understand that you know this is virtual but i'm happy to host people in person um when when if you get in touch with us and you you know maybe in autumn you can say we can organize a virtual uh, in person tour um but this obviously is for um it, virtual because we understand that people were actually in the regions and not necessarily based in london today so the british library for those of you who don't know um um, you know, it's been around for 25 years in this location. I'm actually coming to you from the office um, for uh, it's been here for 25 years, but we've been around for 50 years. So next month we actually celebrate our 50th anniversary um, and it was created by an act of parliament. You know, there was always a presence at the British Museum. Um, but when this building was open, it made us obviously came together as the one British library um, here in London, but also there's a Boston Spa site in Yorkshire. Um, it is a legal deposit library. We have um, um, collections items at the University of Cambridge, but also University of Oxford, um, National Library of Wales, National Library of Scotland, um, and also um, Trinity uh, or, uh, um, University in Dublin. So. We are a legal deposit library, so where people are obliged to deposit item here. We've always had um, uh, um, collections going back for centuries, but it was obviously part of the British Museum. And this area around where I'm based is actually also the knowledge quarter for those of you who are interested in the profession. So this was the old reading room at the British Museum. Believe it or not, I actually went here on Monday. I didn't know I was going to be visiting this room on Monday, but um, uh, we went to see the archivist at the British Museum, and I thought she was going to take us to one a modern part of where they work. I just made an assumption, but when I got there, it was actually in this room, and it's it's really beautiful still um, at the British Museum, and they have the archive for the British Museum, which used to belong to the British Library. So we have great links with the British Museum, and they likewise um, need us as well at times for the the collection that they need to refer to. So for those of you who haven't been to the British Library, we're now based at King's Cross, and we're here for anyone to do research. It's a great place to be if you're an information and library professional like me. There are obviously more specific roles such as um, the one I do for business and intellectual property here, but obviously you get distracted by the digital scholarship teams and for the various things that um, that happens around the library. This is a short clip video, but I won't play it in, because I, I actually only have about 10 minutes before I have to meet someone. Um, and she's a she's an international visitor, so I don't want you to panic and think, oh, Seema hasn't turned up. So I'm not going to play this video, but this is what um, we, we look like. We're a very beautiful building at the heart of um, St. Pancras. Um, the building, the Gothic, new Gothic building behind is in Pancras Station. Um, it was built with uh, the, a naval sort of um, 
theme by uh, Colin St. John. He was in the Navy and he actually actually built the, the, the building shaped like a ship if you look at it from this angle. And what you might not know, and I didn't really know until I started working here, is that there's actually four layers of um, levels of books stored underground at the St. Pancras site. Um, it used to be an old graveyard. Um, so the the designer um, Colin St. John, um, you know, they took a long time to excavate the building. It was over budget um, and it took about 25 years to be built. So we obviously have been here now for 25 years and um, it's a great listed um grade one listed building which means it's really really um loved now it used to be considered ugly but now it's loved by everyone um with also the first librarian um at the british library was antonio panizzi he, he worked for the british museum at the time and he started collecting books so um, there are actually uh, there is actually a bust of him in in the building and he worked there is a room name after him the founders of the british um library was uh obviously well-to-do men at the time. Hans Sloan collection was at the British Museum. I actually saw some of his documents on Monday when I went to the British Museum archive, but they bequeathed their collections to the British Museum at the time, which became part of the British Library. And in the context of um, uh, the anti-racism projects that we've done, we recognize that some of these founding fathers of the uh, British Museum and British, British Library collection did have some links to the slave trade in the Caribbean. So um, that context was actually displayed and is currently displayed in our, in our library entrance. So yes, the library is still great for anyone who wants to do research from creative research to curiosity, to sound, to, to, um, uh, to maps, to various format. And it's still a great place for everyone to, to actually um, uh, to engage with the collection. Uh, this is our picture of our chief executive, Roly. So, and he says libraries are values for global collaboration. Our values are, are really important if you're going into the profession. We're custodians where we do research, we do business, we do culture we do learning and we're international in perspective there's actually a light an international leaders program that's happening as well this summer and it happened as well last summer and it's managed by the international team um we also have the living knowledge Let network that happens across the uk um collaborating with various public libraries and other libraries even universities um, across the uk so it's very interesting to actually work in this joint up way across the uk and also we also need to think Think about libraries as space. Um, during the pandemic, we all pivot to online, um, but we also want to see people back in our spaces because, you know, even the Business and IP Centre, which is the middle photograph, we have licenses that are bound for people to come in and use the collection only in the centre. The collection works as an archive as well, so we don't we're not a lending library, of course, we have the document supply Center, which is a lending library based in Yorkshire, but you know we, we need people to come into these spaces and to use the space and to be inspired um, and to have those meetings and you know talk to each other and learn from each other as well in physical spaces. Um, we have great events, late events and, 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 and cultural events as well, as well as talk in our conference center. The exhibitions has been great. It's one of my favorite things and one of the privileges of being at, here at the British Library from women to Buddhism, to Shakespeare, to West Africa, to the Mughal, as I said, really made me understand that aspect of culture to propaganda, to um, I think the most recent one of relating to information professional skills itself was news and newspaper um, exhibition. The King's Library sits in the middle of the British Library. It it used it, the space was actually built for a card catalog um, in in the late. 80s and early noughties but then by that time we had digital catalog so the space was actually used for the king's library which was um, be, um given by king george the third to the um it belonged to him but his son made um gave it to the government at the time to 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 look after it um and that used to be at the british museum i understood um this monday and now that collection the, the king's library sits at the heart of the british library if you were to come into the physical space we also have the treasures gallery which has things as the magna carta it has lyrics by the beatles it had a da vinci a leonardo da vinci um 
um, materials. It has Shakespeare folios. It has sacred books. Um, it has the Lindisfarne Gospel. Really, really um, special materials that are held in our Treasures Gallery. The Treasures Gallery is free to attend to as long as it's, um, you, you, if you want to visit it, you have to just make sure it's actually open to the public on the day that you intend to visit because sometimes they might close it for some reason or the other. But it's all of these items are free to view in the Treasures Gallery and you can see it without a, um, a pass. We also have free exhibition space. I think currently there's an exhibition on, oh, I can't remember. But over the years, there's been uh, sound, there's been uh, Gay UK, uh, there's been uh, uh, exhibitions on CAT. I think, yes, I think there's an actually an exhibition on digital storytelling at present. I think it might be chargeable, but obviously there are multiple exhibitions happening at the British Library. We also have the fillet Thetic, um, philatelic co co uh, collection. I've never actually seen the creator, but obviously you can pull out these cards in the, the, the foyer and look at stamps and various sort of um, currencies from some of the uh, colonies that the British Empire um, actually had at the time. Um, and I hope to see the curator one day. We have interesting talks. I think we're, the Knowledge Center is now open again. This is one of the talks on the James Cook um, voyages to, to Oceania. Um, you, you see some amazing things in the library. This was Myri Danson um, to, to sort of talking about hip hop. I think one of the most memorable ones I visited recently um, in the Knowledge Center here at the British Library was um, Vivian Westwood, um, who died recently, the fashion designer. And we currently have a business and IP women's event in the Knowledge Center tonight. But as usual, I've double booked, triple booked, and I can't attend um, the event. Um, but obviously, to visit and use the research collection of the British Library, if you're not using the interlibrary loans with Document Supply Center, you can get a reader's pass, which is free to obtain. You just need to prove your residence um, and, and where you live and you get access to the collection. Um, and you, the reader registration team looks after that. If you can't come into the British Library, you can use the digital collections. Um, there's more and more things are digitized. So you can look at our things that are available. There are specialist collections such as the Ethos, which is a PhD um, thesis. Um, portal and uh, where you can find out information. There's the Endangered Archive um, program. There's a sounds, um, I think there's a new sound since this slide. Um, so they're very specialist ones that you can check and see what we have. We do have the digital scholarship team that look on various things such as uh, collaborative projects. They look at uh, what's new and what's on the horizon. Um, we're currently going through a program of gaming, um, which is also going to be launched. They're the team that's actually putting on the digital storytelling exhibition. And yes, there's, there's actually a big article recently about gaming at the British Library. They've been doing gaming for a while using the collections, um, but also encouraging people to use it. Um, the Sound Archive, to develop apps and different gaming um, tools. But the physical reading rooms are divided into subject areas. So we are a bit like a ship um, as intended by the, the designer. Um, on one side, you've got uh, ourselves, business and IP center, the newsroom and the social sciences. And on the other side of the ship, you have things like the rare books, um, humanities and maps and other specialist um, subject areas. So we are siloed into different subject areas, but it's also great to specialize in these areas. As I mentioned, there is a location 200 miles away from London in Boston Spa. One of my first jobs at the, uh, being a librarian was to order uh, articles by fax um, from uh, from where I worked at the time at Coopers and Libran um, to Boston Spa and you get things that were sent urgently or things that would take about three days. But now I'm on the inside and um, yes, we still have overnight bus um, um, transit that goes from Boston Spa to London. It's, it's actually Boston Spa is in the middle of the country in Yorkshire and they have some great teams there that um, work with us um, to, to make sure that we deliver services for the library as a whole. The one thing about the British Library as well, you must think of it in terms of format. So we have maps, we have images, we have sound, we have stamps, and all of these sort of 
um, inform creativity. We also have patterns, which is very important for my our collection here at the Business and IP Centre News. So as an information professional, I always think, uh, I know Bini was talking about books and journals and various formats and online databases. So for me, working at the library is so great because there are so many different formats and so many different subject areas that makes me I never get bored and I always feel inspired and I, I do think it's a privilege to work here at the British Library having access to all of this. So the Sound Archive just recently launched a sound event as well. Um, the One of the biggest exhibitions I think recently, as I mentioned, was breaking the news as an information professional um, and with a newsroom put on some some mini exhibitions. I work in the Business and IP Centre, which has helped thousands of businesses across the, the UK and, and internationally as well, because we do webinars um, and online events. And um, I love working in the Business and IP Centre. It really helps me. And um, I use the content that I have to inspire me. We have very expensive commercial databases that uh, maybe a public library might not have. Um, and uh, we have um, academic uh, organizations referring some of their students to us. So we do get to see students as well. Um, and we we do lots of projects that always keeps me inspired. And we also have a social aspect to it. A lot of our, our, our users are actually women, um, are people of, of Black and Asian minority. And we have a, a linked up look across the UK now with 22 um, Business and IP Centre, which stemmed from the first Business and IP Centre at the British Library. And like yesterday, I was in my local library delivering a workshop to 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 entrepreneurs there and it was it was they were actually creative entrepreneurs so it's really interesting the things that you do at the business and ip center um we also have like creative initiatives here at the british library this is the higher education team working with fashion students um to actually having talks um about albums and sound in in the center so i just want to highlight how libraries plays an important part about in economic um you know activity in the uk but also creative Activity and archiving and, and the inspiration that comes with libraries as well. And the Living Knowledge Network, um, it's done amazing things across the UK. Um, I think we've had lots of projects over the years with various libraries, and it's, it's also a great um, inspiration to how we do knowledge management across um, the sector. And I, 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 it is a diverse organization where I work. I like working here. Our customers are very diverse. Um, I, I really would recommend anyone who would like to work in the British Library look have a have a look at our um, recruitment pages. I'm actually going to be recruiting soon for a couple of posts and. If you're thinking about getting involved in business information and would like some experience or to come and see me or have a tour of the British Library, I'm very happy to, to make time for you. And um, there are plans also to develop the building site that's between us and the Crick Institute. And uh, maybe in about six years time, we'll have an incubator space, we'll have a fab lab, um, an art gallery, family research center, and a whole new building behind the British Library building in London. And obviously we do international projects, which is really exciting. And the team are amazing. They're really supportive when I went to India and Detroit. And one of the most recent things that we would like to do is obviously see diversity in the profession. So um, I worked on the anti-racism project a couple of years ago. That's gonna be finishing at the end of the year. And we're pro proactively trying to do um, race equality action plan here at the British Library. We also have the Alan Turing Institute at the British Library. Um, for those of you into data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning, and um, you can come in and see the Enigma code in the British Library. You can't really go into the Alan Turing Institute without booking a time and with them or going to their events, but you can certainly see their space here, um, the, the reception space and the Enigma code. So we have various, obviously, collections. Um, Liz Jolly is our chief librarian. She's an amazing person. And I just wanted to highlight that to you as students. You know, uh, you can see that, you know, you can actually do really interesting things in your jobs. Um, if you volunteer as well, like me, you can get to do um, get I, I do lots of hard work, but also great experience to an international community. And I hope that we um, actually encourage you to keep in touch with us with SLA and get involved and we you know listen to our stories and people who've gone before you and we hope to mentor you if necessary um, and do get in touch. I know I've rushed through this because I had less time but 
um, here are my details and I'm sure Julia and Hillary can pass on the details if you want to come and see me or you want to meet to meet with me to discuss how you can get involved in business information or how you can get involved with SLA and how we can help you. So thank you very much and I hope that was useful. Thanks very much, Sarah. That was really insightful and I really enjoyed that with your tour through the British Library Treasures as well. Thanks very much for your time. So um, now we're ready for um, the rest of the questions that you've been all pasting um, furiously into the chat. Um, I know some of them have already been answered online, haven't they? Okay, so the first question we had um, was from Alex, and I think everybody's really answered this one already in the chat. It was basically asking um, what um, Binny and um, Thema and also Julia liked most about being a, a library information professional. Yeah, I think I said um, because of the legal research inquiries we get sometimes where it's just frustrated the lawyers for so long and they eventually come to us and ask, can you help me? Um, and we have to put our detective hat on and try and find that answer for them. And usually, you know, it could be simple, or really complicated, but it's always good when we can get the answer and, and give it to them. And then they're just, they're just so relieved that we were there to, to help them. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I can certainly identify with that as well. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, I think um, I didn't put anything in the chat yet, but. I think what I'm enjoying at the moment, what we're doing is um, it's a period of a, there's a lot of data cleanup at the moment, which I really enjoy, but we're kind of, um, we're modernizing some things in the library and trying to improve some of our processes. So obviously as a systems person, I'm doing a lot in our library management system, but I'm also trying to improve our online resources, access to them and um, all our different kinds of users, and then also improving the library management system for the library team. Um, so I'm doing a lot of work together with another colleague of mine, but also, as I said before, with teams across the house. Um, so it it supports the work of the Institute. And um, it's it's a time where I can really see what I'm doing is doing that. Because sometimes I go to work and just work all day. Um, but it's nice to um, have a context for what I'm doing in the wider work of the Institute. So that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, that sounds absolutely excellent. That's lovely. Um, so next question, we've got one um, which was uh, posed to Binny, asking um, about how um, you you mentioned that you relocated from the Wirral. Do you mind sharing with the audience uh, whether you have a hybrid or remote working um, arrangement um, with Chat House? Yeah, I, I do have an arrangement. So... Um... When we went into lockdown, the institute closed and everybody moved to working online and the library didn't open again for a while. And when it did, it was just by appointment. So I didn't go into the library um, at all in like 2020 or 2021. And I realised I could do almost all of my role uh, remotely. Um, and the things I couldn't do, we weren't doing at that time anyway when the library was closed. And also during that time, I decided to move back to the Wirral to leave London and move to move out of London like a lot of people did. And I kept working remotely, but then I asked uh, officially if I could um, change to a remote role. And um, luckily, luckily, my manager agreed to that, although sometimes he likes to joke that um, he shouldn't have, but it's too late now. Um, <laughs> but I did a flexible working request. So my contract has been changed as well. So um, at the moment, as in a lot of workplaces, there's talk of mandating that everyone's back in the office two days a week, but that my contract's already changed, so I am a remote worker. Um, almost everything that I do in the library, I could do remotely, although we did rearrange some of our tasks. So I took some from my manager and my other colleague, and they took on a couple of things that I was doing in the office. Um, I have arranged that I go to the office. I go to London once a month. So I come down to London uh, once a month for two days. And it's really to meet colleagues, chat to people. I don't get much work done. It's mostly meetings while I'm there, but it's good to... Like, there's a lot of new hires and things like that. So it is good to meet people in person occasionally and not just on the screen. Excellent. What was that? 90, 95% remote, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds like the best of both worlds. Um, a question for um, Tim and Simon, um, asking if it's necessary to cover um, all the essential parts um, of a job description when you're doing your application um, through your CV. 
um, because people often find, don't they, that they haven't got something that's marked as essential on um, the job description or person specification. I would say it's very rare that someone meets everything on a job spec. Um, so it's, it's really worth putting yourself forward. Um, but what I would say is the experience you do have, make sure you're articulating that and putting it in context and relating it, even if it's not directly within working in the sector. Um, a bit like we talked about earlier, things like customer service experience, dealing with people, even with technology, um, you know, really try and put that in, in context. But, you know, most, most job adverts are a wish list um, and there's always a compromise somewhere that might be that you have you know, 80% of, of what's on there or 60% of, of what's on there. Um, the big thing normally employers are looking for is a real intent to um, come in and grow and, 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 and make a success of a, of a, of a role and, um, you know, passion for what you're doing. Um, Tim, I don't know if you'd add anything to that. I think um, from my perspective, it's becoming particularly in legal circles, it seems to be becoming harder and harder for firms to hire, and there's lots of reasons for that. So, yeah, I think a lot of firms are a lot more flexible as well. Um, so, yeah, we're and the sort of profile of hire that quite often we make is someone who has probably 60% of the skills, but perhaps they'll learn the other 40% of those skills and um when they actually join that firm and i think from the reason a lot of firms go for that profile is because um i think that learning while you're in the role being challenged every day that's a, the profile of person that's going to be motivated for a longer period of time than someone who's simply transferring their skill set and experience from one firm to another for slightly more money so in a roundabout way i'd say yeah generally i think firms are being a lot more flexible so yeah, I wouldn't hold back on applying anything for anything that you think that you could potentially be suitable for. Well, that's all the questions that we've had in the chat. Has anybody else got any questions that they'd like to ask? I just want to add on as well, come, coming off from what Simon and Tim have said. I didn't say uh, for, for all my roles, um, it was a two stage interview. So kind of the first stage was actually, you know, them looking through my CV and taking notes and kind of asking those questions. Um, but for the second round, um, it was more kind of showing me who I was as a person and why, um, you know, why I would be a good fit for the team or, you know, for the firm um, and what I was looking to actually get out of, of the role for them. So it's kind of that to um, that dual aspect there, you know, show, show yourself um, off as, as much as possible, but make sure you are, hitting those um, keywords in the description. And that's why it's always good to have examples in your back pocket um, where you can show, you know, your experience or, you know, scenarios if they put you on the spot um, and ask you those sorts of questions that you've always got um, something to come back with. Excellent. Yeah. I've got a question, actually, because since the pandemic, I've heard more and more people have actually had interviews where they have to give a, um, an interview online or even a presentation online. What kind of tips would you um, give Simon and Tim for people who had to apply online for a job? Yeah, I, I, I've got actually a, a sheet of tips which I can put into the chat for that specifically. Um, but yeah, generally, I mean, if when I think about the, the roles that I work on, at least the first stage is normally an online discussion, even if it's going to be an in-person role now. Um, and it, it's been fantastic because actually if you're comfortable doing that and I think we're all quite well practiced at Zoom now um, but what it's meant is that we used to have all these blocks where a firm would want to interview someone but they then had to take half a day off and it was really really difficult but people are because people are hybrid working now on on the whole a lot of people have a bit more flexibility it just means that people can can you know get to opportunities easier they're not stopped from doing it by uh, um, by, by, by having to physically go and, and, and meet someone. Um, but um, yeah, you know, just think about your surroundings, you know, get rid of any distractions, make sure you've got two glasses of water, um, I would, um, and, you know, have your notes um, and, and, and have all the stuff that you can go back to when you get jammed up, because um, it happens to everyone. 
especially when you get like the question that you weren't expecting or whatever. It's really good to have some stuff to go back to um, and then also have your questions for them. So think about what you could ask them that shows that you've um, researched the company and um, shows that you've you know really shown an interest and in that you're interested in them if you are interested in them. Um, but um, yeah, um, so, so, you know, that's, that's what I'd say on that, Tim. I don't know if I've missed anything. Well, I think a lot of people actually, yeah, um, prefer that virtual uh, and online uh, type first interview. And it typically is the first interview. Second interview tends to be in person now, but um, people like that because of the flexibility of it. Um, I think the people also like the fact that uh, when you're doing a virtual or online interview, perhaps the person who's interviewing you can't see that your laptop's absolutely plastered in post-it notes and notes that otherwise you might not have available to you in a face-to-face -face meeting. So, uh, yeah, it works really well for, for a lot of people. We get a lot of good feedback about it. But, yeah, we're seeing increasingly uh, a lot of firms now are going back to, to doing more and more sort of in-person interviews. Awesome. Uh, um, I've got a question for Binny as well, because the fact that you told us that you worked in uh, different countries made me think of some of our audience tonight that might actually want to do that. What kind of advice would you give to somebody if they were thinking of doing an information role in a different country? I Well, I found that um, you know, my I didn't have a problem getting a job in a different country just because it was a different country, but I do speak Swedish and English fluently. So I'd say maybe the language. Um, there are there make sure that if if you want to move somewhere and you don't speak the language either that you're going to learn or that they it could be an international workplace where people do speak English, for example. I mean that might seem obvious, but um not speaking the language of the country you're moving to isn't necessarily a barrier depending on the job and the workplace. But being willing to learn is probably a good thing. There's, um, in Sweden, there'll be lots of workplaces where they say, oh, business language, language is English, but everybody will speak Swedish in the job anyway. Um, and I think uh, when it comes to libraries that um, I had lots of colleagues who, well, I had other colleagues who were also um, from other countries or who'd studied in other places. And that was always fine, actually. Um, I think libraries are probably quite... Uh, good at recognizing degrees from other degrees and experience from other countries. I can see Simon's nodding there, but I think so. Yeah, yeah. We we work with lots and lots of international applicants all the time. Um, we get some fabulous people um, who have studied overseas, or or we get actually a lot of people that that um, come here to study that, that have come from overseas. And yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of recognition for that. And um, um, I, I what I find actually is these groups are hugely valuable for people to come and sort of settle and start building a professional network so you know i always suggest to people you know get along to the sla party or or, or you know go and go and meet some people at these sorts of things and it it really really helps um but yeah absolutely i think probably the, the main issue would be things like work work and residence permits so we recruited a new colleague last year and Chatham House has a rule that you already have to have the right to live and work in the UK before you can apply for jobs. So that will be a hindrance for some applicants. But I know different jobs have different requirements, but that's we ha we screened out some applicants because they they tick the box saying they weren't eligible to work. So you know, there wasn't really any point applying, but some people do anyway. Yeah, yeah that, that's definitely always a challenge. It's actually seemed to get slightly easier for, for for some nationalities over the past couple of years but um, it's definitely always a challenge That's great, yeah. you're a rising star of sla um, how's groups like sla have helped you in your career so far it's definitely kind of opened up um just meeting other people who i would have naturally met um if i'd stayed um kind of within my role or kind of within um, just talking to law librarians um, and I kind of kind of seen that in my second role I definitely did want to branch out because um, I was in a small team I didn't feel as you know I still wanted to grow my my network and 
build those contacts and I thought you know where else better than than SLA Europe because again um like Benny I have um dual nationality with Italy so I you know it could have it could be my future at this point but if I do want to kind of relocate to Italy there's that option um but yeah I just wanted to sort of expand my own network and my own understanding of what um what libraries were out there even what special libraries were out there um kind of beyond the realm of um law firms and, and public libraries and kind of even historical libraries that um that i was aware of because you know i don't feel i would have learned it as much if i hadn't um kind of actually joined uh these associations and said you know who are you what do you do um can i learn more about your your role so it's been hugely kind of beneficial that way and actually connecting um with those people just to learn learn more about what they do and you know how they started out what their background was um because yeah i think the the rule is that we're probably all accidental um librarians but how we get there and how we've actually made the role our own is always um a great story to, to share with others as well yeah indeed yeah that's really nice thank you very much everybody um for presenting um tonight and all those for attending i just want to do a final share um of our slides. As we promised, um, we'll be sending you um, a copy of the slides and the recording um, of the event will go on to, um, excuse me, um, the SLA Europe um, YouTube page. If you're interested in finding out more about the kind of events um, that file CLSIG and SLA Europe are running, um, or you're thinking of joining one of those groups, feel free to visit the website addresses, which we have on the final slide, and follow all of them on Twitter and LinkedIn. And thank you very much for attending. <laughs>